out. Okay, super. Okay, I'll click on continue. Yes, please. Lovely. Okay, so welcome back. Um, and today we're joined by Matt Appleton from RSM, along with Dan, who's going to assist him today. Um, and they're going to be talking about R&D tax credits. So over to you both, gents. Excellent. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, so my name is Matt. I'm joined by Dan, and we've got some slides to share with you. Please feel free to, to, to look at the slides, but obviously we're going to talk about some really interesting stuff, and the slides are there in case you want to look at them as well. So we're going to talk about tax and innovation, specifically around R&D, tax relief credits. So today's session, and I will introduce myself and, and allow Dan to introduce himself in a second. But first of all, let's talk about what we're going to talk about. So we're going to focus on R&D relief. We'll have an overview of what it means um, and what it's worth as well. And in terms of what it means, you know, an overview, what the advances are, what the uncertainties are, that all comes into the definition of what you need to do to get the relief. And we'll have a specific focus on, on the digital economy. We'll talk about how you can make a claim. And we will also touch upon some other reliefs that might be appropriate um, and can be just as beneficial. And then at the end, we'll have some time set aside for people to ask any questions and we will do our best to provide answers to those questions. Um, should any arise. So to introduce myself and RFM, my name is Matt Appleton. I am a director and I specialise in innovation tax relief. So for the last several years, I've helped companies from all sectors, but with a particular bent in the tech, and media and telecommunication sector to make sizable and successful R&D claims, often helping companies double or even triple um, claims they've made previously. Um, and RSM is a firm, we're uh, an accountancy, tax and advisory firm, uh, you know, just, just a, a very, very brief plug. You know, we do, we do what you would expect an accountancy and tax firm to do well, but what we really try to do is to add value. And one of those ways we add value are these tax breaks. Dan, do you want to introduce yourself? Thanks, Matt. Good afternoon, everyone. My name's Dan Tilbert. I'm a corporate tax associate at RSM. I've been with the firm for uh, around three years, but I've been taxed for around eight, uh, and I'm a chartered tax advisor. So I work specifically in innovations relief for the firm, as, as Matt was just referencing, uh, but predominantly my work is, is in research and development tax relief. Um, I'm based in the Southampton office, and we focus especially there on the technology and software claims. Excellent. Thank you, Dan. So we're going to move on and get into the, the main course, as it were, R&D tax relief and overview. And I'm going to pass over to Dan, who's going to kick things off. We will swap um, during the course of the, um, of the session. Dan, so, you up first. Thank you. I just wanted to start by explaining a bit around what R&D relief is and why it is made available. So. The UK wants to be considered as having a competitive corporate tax system in order to su support growth and attract investment into the UK. Um, one of the ways it seeks to achieve this is through R&D relief. So the government gives R&D tax relief to companies that are undertaking qualifying innovative work when that work satisfies certain criteria, which are on your screen. But broadly, the criteria are that the company must undertake a project which seeks to achieve an advance in science or technology, or we'll focus on technology, through the resolution of technological uncertainties. So this can be through direct activities, um, and it can also be in some cases through certain indirect activities. Thank you, Matt. Next slide, please. So what does that mean? Um, let's start with the advance. So an advance can either be an advance in knowledge, or in capability, or indeed it could be in, in both. So it could be a brand new process, a product, a service, which goes beyond those previously available. Um, it needs to represent an advance in the overall state of knowledge or capability in the field of technology. So to provide some specific examples, bring it to life a bit, it could, 
It could be the creation of a new functionality or flexibility in a system to make it more performant, more scalable, or it could be to enable integrations of disparate technologies that otherwise hadn't been integrated or the, the knowledge of how to do so wasn't available. It doesn't necessarily have to be brand new. It doesn't have to be a new process or a service. It could be an appreciable improvement to an, an existing one. So that means an appreciable improvement is one which is not routine. It's not a routine analysis or bug fixing or adaptation, and it goes beyond just those standard business as usual type things. It's also worth noting that even if the advance in technology that is sought is not actually achieved, there can still be R&D in, in that process. And finally, if an advance has already been made by another company, say, but how to do so not available, then uh, another company can make a claim for R&D relief if, if they have to go through that process themselves where that information is not available um, in public domain. I mean, just to, just to maybe bring it even further, you know, an example of something that might be an advance, you might have a legacy system and you may need that to integrate with some new third parties. And because your legacy system is just that, a bespoke legacy system, um, there may be no known way to integrate your system with someone else's. So, you know, you might be creating some new APIs from scratch to achieve that. And that might represent, for example, and advance over what we've known before. Just as one example. Thanks, Matt, absolutely. So next, the next part of the definition is the uncertainty. So broadly, an uncertainty exists when a solution is not readily deducible to a competent professional, which is a term defined by HMRC, working in that particular field of technology. Um, a competent professional is someone who's aware of the current step of knowledge, knows of its limitations and what's out there. Um, they, there might be uncertainty as to whether something is technically possible, or it might be perhaps it's clear that something's possible, but not how it's possible. Uh, so the feasibility could uh, give uncertainty as well. Uh, I like to think of it as a technical head scratching moment. So when your competent professionals need to go away and really think about how to achieve something, that there's likely to be some uncertainty there. The definition yeah. can also include system uncertainties. So for example, it might be feasible to create a new process or a service, say, but when you try to implement that into your, your architecture or your infrastructure, it creates an unacceptable performance or latency issue, for example, which that itself cannot be readily resolved. The resolution of that could, could give rise to system uncertainty, which, which could qualify for R&D relief. And um, as rightly pointed out on the slide, people, people often undersell their knowledge. So, um, we, we speak all the time to people with advanced degrees in computer science, for example, and they will tell us that there's no R&D. What they do is business as usual, it's routine. But we often ask them, well, why are they, why are they being hired to do routine or maintenance activities when they've got such advanced qualifications? It's clear there's something that they're doing under there that's, that's technically very difficult. But I think where they're doing it every day, perhaps they don't appreciate that. So we can help by... by um, sort of pointing out areas that they do undertake, which, which do satisfy the guidelines. Thanks for that, Matt. I think you had a particular example on, on uncertainties you wanted to, to mention. Um, yeah, I can mention uh, an example on uncertainties. I, mean, I used to, to work with a chap and just following on from your point, and, and he actually moved from industry into doing R&D. And he said, with the benefit of hindsight, 70% of what he and his team were doing was technological uncertainty because what they were doing was they were developing uh, well, they were developing improvements over and above um, what they had achieved before and they didn't know how to do it. Um, you know, in that particular case, you know, there, there, was a, there was some issues around how they could make it work at scale. Um, you know, the theory of it was sound in isolation, but to get to the scale they wanted, you know, there was there was a constraint around the capacity they had, so they had to develop a new way of doing it. It wasn't just a case of chucking more service capacity at it, because that's a, a different story. Let's move on to software and technology. So we touched upon some of these, 
Um, but just to, to put a bit more meat on the bones, of our, you know, software and technology specifically, what we what we see a lot of building on a vanilla or existing or theoretical technology. So you don't, you know, there might be you know a theoretical thing maybe on the public domain open source, um, but it might be you know just that you know, brand new cutting edge theory. But how you actually get that to work in your bespoke business requirements that's where there's technological uncertainty you can't just take it and, and use it you've got to adjust it so it's fit for purpose likewise you might buy in a, in a new for example erp system and you know you need it to do stuff that it doesn't do and you can't just tweak it within its known parameters and you go to the provider and they say well it's never designed for that so you're then having to develop something on top or it may well be that you're looking for something and it just doesn't exist. You're having to build it from scratch to meet those requirements you have. Um, we've talked about integration of disparate systems already. Um, where companies often forget to look is their back of house development. So it's not just the software that they might be selling or a portal that clients are using, but they might have R&D around their own CRM system or CMS system. Um, or all sorts of things where it's not seen or used by the client, but it's still R and D and it's still helping the business. And as as, as Dan as, as mentioned, system uncertainty can be very key, very key. Um, just touching again on software, as Dan has mentioned, you know, there's often performance related and fun um, and, and functional. So if, you, if, you, if you've built you know, one example to encapsulate everything, you might have a new module that you're developing that's never been designed by before. So first of all, you're developing that, which is like new functionality. You're then integrating it into your existing bespoke platform. Um, so you're then building on top of something that already exists, but by integrating it, it might cause um, an unacceptable slow down or, or it may, you know it may well be that the data fields are such that it creates false positives and therefore you, you've got the issues around performance you know so there's lots of ways that this can arise and it's not necessarily straightforward software and technology is a, is a key area for R&D relief and if you undertake R&D you should definitely consider making the claim. But there are a few warnings. As long as you're doing your claims in the right way, it shouldn't be an issue. But HMRC does have scrutiny over these claims. You know, I mean, they, they don't typically pick up every claim and, and raise inquiries, but there is the risk that HMRC will say, we want to understand a little bit more about that. Now, I've been quite fortunate, coach calls, et cetera, not seen many of those queries recently, but it can happen. HMRC also in the last couple of years have started using their own IT specialists. So whereas you make the decision as to whether there is scope for an RD claim because you believe it meets the requirements, they have their own IT specialists who might come along and say, well, we work in the industry and we think that that's known, or we don't think it's R&D because. And you need to be able to, to counter those arguments. And I, I've certainly had dealings with HMRC to, HMRC IT specialists, they're very knowledgeable, um, but there is always um, scope to discuss. And just because they say it's not doesn't mean to say they're correct. Um, so just be aware, one, that they exist, and two, just because they say something doesn't mean to say that the claim is going to fall down. HMRC have in the past, quite rightly said, um, user interface and automation in and of itself you know, doesn't necessarily mean it's R&D, but equally, it can be R&D, and that's quite key. We're not talking about aesthetic or, or routine sort of work here. We're talking about, you know, does it meet the qualification that Dan's already talked through? Um, and often there is development under the bonnet where you're connecting front end to back end, and that can still qualify for R&D. So just because you might have heard something around UI and automation being something that agency don't like. 
It's not that they don't like it, they just want to make sure you're meeting the, the correct qualifications. And as long as you do, there's scope for a claim. Commercial build, I've seen challenges as well where HMRC has said, well, that's not R&D, it's a commercial build. But again, you go back to basics. Does it meet the criteria of R&D? And if it does, there's scope for a claim. And certainly I've had discussions with HMRC on that in the past and HMRC have been accepted out of the position. The last point, and we're going to come back to this later on, um, costs that qualify. Um, there are costs, which Dan will explain in a moment, that qualify for R&D. Specifically around software and technology, these may be changing, but we don't know for sure. We'll come back to that in a moment. I'm now going to hand over to Dan, who's going to talk to us about what this is all worth, because it's, it's lovely to talk about tax to a degree. It's lovely to talk about what R&D is for tax purposes, but at the end of the day, it comes down to what is it worth to your business? Dan. Thanks, Matt. So in determining what the claim is worth, um, you first need to consider which regime the company falls into. So there are two regimes. There's the SME uh, and for small companies and medium enterprises and large company project scheme. And the value of the relief that you will receive really depends on, on which scheme the company falls into. But now the thresholds are noted on the slide there. Um, if your company falls within those, then, then it can claim under SME. If it falls without those, it's harder. Although I should note that with the caveat that in all but the most simple cases, you're not just looking at the only, a single company, you might be looking at uh, a group, or if there's private equity backing, for instance, you will be looking at the controlling party to consider those thresholds. So, so the size needs some careful consideration. Why does it matter though? Um, in short, the mechanisms and the value of the relief are quite different between the schemes. So the SME, SME scheme is more generous than the RDEX scheme, and the RDEX scheme is also more restrictive in some of the costs that you can claim. Um, I'll touch on again uh, in a moment. So what's the value? Um, under the SME scheme, um, the relief works by way of an enhanced deduction. So you, you get an additional 130% deduction for any qualifying spend. Um, so in practice for profit-making companies, that will reduce your profit by 130% of the expenditure, uh, thereby reducing uh, profits chargeable to corporation tax by the same. Uh, in effect, the, the cash benefit as such is around 24 pence in the pound for every pound spent on qualifying R&D for profit-making SMEs. Uh, for loss-making SMEs, the relief mechanism is slightly different. Uh, the losses, certain losses, can be uh, surrendered for a repayable tax credit of 14.5%. In effect, the company can get around 33.35 pence in the pound for every pound of qualifying expenditure. Again, this is with a caveat that they are actually surrendering losses, so they're, they're, they're losing losses, which could otherwise be utilised. I can just jump in there, Dan. It's an interesting point. If you're profit making and loss making, you're not comparing apples, to apples, you're comparing apples and pears, because in one case, you're getting tax relief for your hundred pounds, you're getting tax relief on your hundred under the normal rules, which would be 19, you're then getting an additional 24 pounds. So if you compare that to the loss making, you're, you're, you're surrendering all of the losses, and you're getting 33. So what is clear is that it's a better relief if you're profit making because overall you get more of a saving but the benefit if you're loss making is if you can't use those losses or you don't think you're going to be able to use those losses in the near future you can give them up and although the overall benefit is less it does mean jam today rather than jam tomorrow absolutely thank you for that yeah loss making is a, is a cash flow benefit for sure there. um so the RDEC regime then, it's a completely different mechanism for RDEC. Um, I won't go into the complexities because it, it is quite complicated how it works through the accounts, but in effect, the cash benefit is around 10 pence in the pound for every pound of qualifying expenditure, which can be used in various ways depending on the circumstances of, of the company. Uh, in some cases, it might be repayment, could be group relief, it might reduce CT liabilities. It depends on, on the company's circumstances. Um, the point to note that is if there are any grants or subsidies, state aid, um, 
paid to SMEs that can taint um, an, either a whole project or, or in fact the whole claim from an SME claim. So it is possible to see SME claims being tainted so that they fall into the RDEC regime. So we need to be careful when looking at uh, claims to consider whether any grants or subsidies have been received. Thank you, Matt. Next slide. Please. Excellent. So we've talked a lot about the, the expenditure. What, what actually qualifies? So you see on the side the, the categories of, of qualifying expenditure. The main one that we, we see in most claims is staff costs. So this is salary, bonuses, commission, employers and I, employers pension, and certain reimbursed expenses. In particular, it's not dividends. Dividends do not qualify uh, for our new tax relief. Each person, you would need to look at their respective eligibility percentages and assign a, a qualifying percent, which is done as part of the process. Next, there's, there's third parties. So there's two types of third parties from, from the R&D tax relief um, def rules. So there's subcontracted costs and there's externally provided workers. And it's an important distinction to make. Sub both are qualifying under SME. Subcontracted costs are very much restricted under the large company regime. Um, so careful consideration needs to be considered as to the contractual terms of the third parties to ensure that they're categorised appropriately. Um, it's quite complex and it depends on the nature of engagement. Um, ultimately, it comes down to looking at various indicators, including supervision, direction and control, who bears the financial risk, things like that. But the main point to note is subcontracted costs to company to company are very restricted under RDEC. Any third party costs from connected, unconnected parties, i.e. companies which are not under common control, will be restricted to 65% in a claim. Uh, that includes EPWs or subcontractors. Any connected party ones are treated differently and we look at the lower of what was recharged from the connected party versus what was included in the connected parties accounts. It's more complicated, just be aware of that. Um, other types of costs include consumables, um, software licenses, and Matt's touched on this already, specifically excludes data storage and hosting costs, which is, we often see a very significant proportion of software licenses codes is made up of data storage and hosting. So that needs to be excluded under the current rules, although there are consultations around whether those should be included in the future. Um, heat, light, and power um, can be apportioned to include in the claim. Um, like I said, on staff costs, it's for all costs, it's necessary to prescribe a qualifying eligibility percentage to each cost to determine the amount that is attributable to R&D activities. And it's also finally worth noting that the cost must be revenue for tax purposes to include in an R&D tax relief claim. And one you. thing I've just added to that is sometimes, and I don't want to get into the accounting because that's not what we're here about, but sometimes we'll find that, especially in software, there'll be costs that qualify which are revenue, but from an accounts point of view, are booked to your balance sheet in certain cases. So just because it's booked to your balance sheet as an intangible fixed asset, doesn't mean to say you can't qualify. Um, and it's worth looking at, because as I said, a lot of companies, they, they um, end up having to put their software development onto their balance sheet. So it just depends and it's worth looking at. So let's move on to the practical. So I've got a little diagram on here, just giving some very, very basic rules. A tax return has to be submitted with the R&D claim. You can't send in a letter, you can't phone them up. It's got to be on a tax return. And that tax return has got to be submitted in good time, which is generally two years from the end of the accounting period. So if you've got, for example, a December year end and you've never made a claim but you think you can, you could do... December 19 and December 20, um, but you couldn't go back to December 18 because we're more than two years away from that. Um, best practice is to prepare a report to support the claim. Now, people sometimes tell me, we don't want to do this because we, we've only got a really small spend. You know, that's a commercial decision. Our position is we would always recommend a report because it's best practice. And that report would typically include examples of the advances, uncertainties, and the work done to overcome those uncertainties, and a summary of the costs uh, and why claiming under the SME or the uh, RDEX scheme, a bit of background on the company. Basically, stuff that we know HMRC like to 
understand so they can look at a plan and go, yeah, we understand why, we understand how, and, and look to basically process that. And we can never guarantee that a report will mean that you get a big green tick straight away. But the, 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 the idea behind it is to try to, one, mitigate the chance of challenge or you get any repayment as quickly as possible. But it's also to disclose information so HMRC can't turn around in two years' time and say, oh, we didn't know about that. If we'd have known about that, we'd have um, restricted the payment. Because so, now we can say, well, actually, it's all being provided to you. You know, if you've not acted on that, you're out of time now. In much the same way, if you have time limits, they have time limits as well. Um, I would always recommend, um, and obviously I'm biased here, but I'm going to try and be um, impartial. I would recommend getting a, a reputable advisor to help on this. Um, obviously, I'm going to plug RSM and myself um, and, and Dan as reputable advisors. You know, but to be fair, there are other firms out there who, you know, who clearly know what they're doing. Um, but as I say, you know, I'm at RSM and I have, you know, um, personally, I believe I've got a good track record, so I'm going to plug that. But I think the key is, if you're unsure, make sure you've consulted with someone who's reputable. Um, and, you know, I, I, it may well be that after a year or two, you're comfortable doing your own claim or you might want that firm or another firm to help you year on year make the most of it but i cannot stress you know i, I, I see things i've seen things in the past as well sharing all stories i've seen people where they put claims in and forgot to um include the staff cost or they put claims in and forgotten to uh, to include whole teams um or they have put claims in and not realize that the people they've been paying overseas can be included still. You know, I've had claims where, you know, they've made a claim, but when you actually review it, you can double or triple, literally double or triple, um, because they've either not included all the costs or they've not included all of the R&D activity. I've seen people put claims in where they've identified the correct amount and They've claimed it's a loss, whereas what they could have done is instead of carrying that loss forward for several years, they could have just asked a cash bank. You know, so these are all, all things. I mean, in one example, I had one where they wanted to carry a loss forward and they could have had cash back of half a million. And, you know, only just went in in time. Otherwise, they would have just, I mean, they would have used it eventually, I'm sure. But, you know, they, you know I think they appreciated having half a million pounds in cash rather than waiting four or five years. To get a reduced tax bill. Um, there's there's lots of things that it's worth just making sure of, um, which is why I say use a a reputable advisor. Um, so that's a little bit about making a claim. Um, every firm would be different, but you know the way we work, and I think to be fair, other advisors work as well, is making sure there's enough around what constitutes R&D, and that's disclosed to HMRC, making sure that the, the costs are identified and reported to HMRC. Um, so, it's not just missing out on maximising your things, I've just given you a couple of examples a moment ago. Um, if you're out of time, the two-year time limit, that's it. You, you, you can't go back and say to the inspector, unless you've got a really good example, um, a really good excuse, I should say, which is very, very difficult to get. You can't just say, yeah, I didn't realise about this relief. Can I go back six years? Um, I had a chat with someone last year and uh, they'd never made a claim. Oh, how, how far can we go back? Oh, two years. Like, We've been doing this for like eight years. I said, I'm really sorry. I said, I? You know, if, if you'd have realised, you couldn't have claimed him, but you know, if you don't put claims in, you're out of time. The only one aware of the, the relief isn't going to get you to a position where HMC will accept the claim. So making sure you get your time in and it's maximised within that time frame is key. If you make an incorrect claim, I mean, firstly, there's reputational damage to you because HMRC might look at it and go, hmm, that's not good. Is there anything else that's wrong in, in the tax return? But 
even over and above that, you know, if you've had money back already, you've got to pay it back, which might not be budgeted for, it wouldn't be budgeted for. There'll be interest on, on, on money you've had and potentially HMRC can go for penalties. You know, so, I mean, I think in reality, HMRC don't always go for a cash penalty, but they could do. And even if it's just a case of a loss being increased by, you know, £100,000 cost of the claim, you know, the penalties can be based on, you know, not just actual tax, but the tax on a loss that you might be able to claim in the future. So, you know, there could be an actual monetary penalty. And, you know, if, if in the future you're looking to sell or, or seek investment and someone's doing a report on, on your company, you know, having a report saying, you know, an R&D claim was made and there was an issue and this penalty was paid and this interest was done and had to be revised, I mean, it's, it's, you can overcome it, but it doesn't look great. So these are all factors. Um, and that's without the time and the effort and the cost of putting something right. Um, I'd like to share another war story, if I may, a, a relatively short one. But a, couple of, a few years ago, I had a company come up to me and say, we've made a claim, taxman's challenged it, can you help? And um, they'd used um, a boutique firm, and, and, there are, and as a rule, all things in life, there are good ones and not so good ones. And, and basically, they put a claim in, and, and basically, there was no R&D there. Um, or rather, it wasn't their R&D. They just basically wrote a check to someone else. And they said, well, can we have, can, we, can you get us the tax relief? And I said, well, to be honest, I can see where HMC are coming from. You know, and they thought they were going to get a, a couple of hundred grand back. And the, and the reality is, is that they weren't and they didn't. And, you know, so instead of expecting a nice big chunk of money back, that, that sort of fell away and they didn't get it. Plus they had um, discussions with the previous agent. And I spoke to a couple of other companies to see if they could help them. And, and you know, the message was no, you can't. Um, you know, it was their own internal time as well. And, and, and the stress of it all, which shouldn't be underestimated. I'm going to talk about some other reliefs now, and I'm just checking the time to make sure we're on track, and we are, which is always positive. That's always positive. So, I'm going to talk about three reliefs. Well, I'm going to talk about two, and I'm going to hand back to Dan for one of them. So the first one I'm going to talk about is pattern box. We're then going to talk about research and development allowances, and then I'm going to talk about the creative sector, which is very, very specific. Just bear with me, I'm calling me. I'll get rid of them. Um, so, let's talk about patterns. Very broadly, because I don't want to dwell on, on, on these too much. If anyone's got any specific questions, I can definitely look to talk it through. So, basically, pattern boxes if you've got a patent from the appropriate Jurisdiction, so UK, Europe, PN Patent Office, or certain certain other countries in Europe, you can get a ten percent tax rate on certain profits derived from that patent. That patent might be on a product or a process. Um, so at the moment, tax rate is nineteen percent. You'd be taxed at ten percent. Going forward, the tax rate is going up to as much as twenty five percent. So it looks like this might become more valuable in time unless they, they change the rules. Um, so there are a series of rules associated with this, but the key ones is we've got to have the qualifying patent. It's only relating to certain types of income. You can claim it in relation to, um, in addition rather to R&D relief, but you need to sort of jump for a few hoops to, to make sure you can claim and there's a mechanical calculation and sometimes you do the calculation and in theory qualify but when you've worked it all through the benefit might be relatively small and then you've got to consider the cost of obtaining stroke maintaining the patent and sometimes it's not worthwhile other times it's massively worthwhile um, and definitely worth going for and in fact there are some companies out there who have looked into getting patents purely because of the tax advantages that holding a patent would have. Um, one, one final example, and this is one of HMRC's own examples when this first came out. 
if you are looking to bring a product in, you don't need to patent the whole product. Um, you only have to patent an aspect. So if it was a calculator, for example, you don't need to patent a calculator. There might be a microchip um, within the calculator. And by getting a patent on that one aspect of a product, the whole thing comes in into the patent box regime. And indeed, just, just one further point on patent box. Software, people ask the machine, you can't get patents on software. Now, I'm not a patent attorney, but I am aware very much so that there are certain instances where software and code can be, um, you can claim uh, for a patent and, and apply for a patent. Um, so it's definitely worth considering. <coughs> and indeed, if you put an application in today and it's granted in two years' time, you could actually accrue the benefit in that patent period, patent pending period, and get it when it's granted. So it's, it's definitely worth a thought. Definitely worth a thought. I'm going to hand over RDAs. Thank you, Matt. So, as I noted earlier on when I was talking through the qualifying costs, for the cost to qualify for RD tax relief, they need to be revenue for tax purposes. And that's not to say that any capital expenditure on R&D activities is outside of any relief. So there are these other reliefs available, research and development allowances, RDAs, which can be claimed over certain qualifying capital R&D spend. So the way they work is, is similar to annual investment allowance, if you're familiar with capital allowances. It's a 100% year, 100 first year deduction for qualifying expenditure. It needs to satisfy broadly the same definition as, as the one which we talked about earlier, but it's capital spend rather than revenue. So the benefit of doing this is that you can bring forward relief. So, so ordinarily relief might be available for that uh, for that spend under the normal capital allowance rules at 8 or 18 percent, for instance, uh, if it's plant and machinery, as an example, uh, this will bring it forward to 100 percent first year. So you're bringing forward the benefit of that relief. Obviously, a clear cash flow saving there. Um, other types of capital expenditure sometimes are not qualifying for capital allowances at all normally. So certain types of expenditure on improving buildings, for example, sometimes are just not uh, uh, eligible to capital allowance relief at all. So under RDAs, in some instances, 100% um, relief can be obtained in year one, which would give an absolute cash saving um, a clear advantage. It's, it's a complex area, uh, and RSM has a dedicated capital analysis team who, who is able to assist you or just have a chat if you've got any particular queries on this. Yeah, please ask them. And just, just to sort of again share a story, a few years ago I had a, a client and they built new premises, and at the time there was very limited relief for the, you know, well, there was no relief on the building itself, but because the new building had roughly 70% R&D use, they got a tax relief from 70% of the new building. If they'd have had no R&D people in there, they'd have got no relief on it. So 70% of the new building got tax deduction, which, you know, is, is not to be sneezed at. It's not just buildings, but, you know, that, that's a, a nice example. Moving on to creative sector. Um, this is a bit niche, but I'm mindful there may be people on the call who this is absolutely uh, relevant, so I'm going to touch upon it. So basically, there is a, a different tax relief available for certain creative sectors. Those are people who make films, people who make or produce high-end television, and, and there are some funny rules about that. It's not got, you know, it's drama, documentaries, certain comedies. Uh, it's got to have a certain spend. So if you're not spending a million pounds on average an hour, and if it hasn't got a slot length for 30 minutes, and there are other rules as well, but those are the two big barriers that I often see. Well, High-end TV, children's television, those barriers don't exist. Animation, and again, there's some rules on that because it can be mixed animation and non-animation, but at least 51% has got to be animation. Video games, very topical with the lockdown just having been and gone. Um, hopefully near enough gone. Um, Theatre, museums and orchestra, which are probably, the last three are probably less relevant to to this audience but i put them there for for completeness the rules for each are 
very slightly different. They've all got the same sort of starting point. Um, the rates vary a little bit, but very broadly it can be worth 20 pence in the pound. Um, it's a different mechanism to the R&D. So I'll take video games as an example. Um, you look at the cost of production of the game in its entirety. You're not looking at saying only staff costs or X or Y. It's broadly all of the cost, and then there are some restrictions, but broadly all of the costs, 20% um, as a benefit. Um, some of these, like the video games, like the film, you have to get certification that the production is British, but the definition of British is actually British or EEA or undetermined nationality or location. So you know, if, you, if you had, for example, Sonic the Hedgehog, he's an undetermined nationality um, running on a platform which is an undetermined location. So whether you agree with the rules or not, the rules are such that you would actually get some of the points towards meeting the a British test on that because of, um, of those facts. So a very interesting area, but appreciates it's, it's relatively, relatively niche. I'd like to also talk about the future. I'm not a futurist, this is just the future of R&D. So I, I mentioned right at the start that there are some changes to the use of analysis. So I'm gonna go straight onto the second bullet point here. So in the past, you could claim for annual software licenses, and as Dan mentioned, things like maintenance, hosting, servers, and stuff like that, you can't get R&D handouts on that. There is a consultation underway. HMRC seem to be open to considering other costs um, in the digital, digital economy. Don't know what the end result is going to be. I'm hoping that the definition of what can qualify from a software-related perspective will grow, but we don't know. We'll find out in due course. That has fed into a wider consultation on R&D generally. Uh, the, the government seem to be suggesting that they want to attract more R&D um, activity. And there are some root and branch questions around, you know, should the SME and the large RBEC regime be amalgamated? Should the rates change? Should there be um, different incentives for different types of R&D or different sectors or different geographic locations? Is there anything else that can be considered? It's very wide ranging. That um, is ongoing, and I'm not expecting to hear back on that in the immediate future, but at some stage this year, I'm sure we will. Again, the, my, my instinct is that they're looking to improve things, but if they give extra benefit on one hand, for example, if they say you can include more software costs or the rate goes up, they're likely to have to balance it somehow, and it may well be that there are restrictions elsewhere. We just don't know. So I'm mentioning it so you're aware that there is a regime out there for R&D and there is a consultation. We believe that it will continue and it may even improve, but it may change. One change we have seen, and this year for accounting periods beginning on or after the 1st of April of this year, is that they've brought back a cap um, based on PAYE for SMEs. So many years ago, there used to be a cap for the tax credits for SMEs. They scrapped it, but now they're bringing it back in, in a different way. So very, very broadly, your cash back on an SME claim, if it's a cash back um, tax credit, will be restricted to three times the company's PAYE plus 20,000. So if you've got a company that starts tomorrow and it incurs a load of R&D costs, but all of those costs are I know, payment to external agencies in another country, and you don't draw a salary down so that basically your, your PAYE for the period is zero, then potentially, I mean, there, there are a few other rules to, to consider, but very broadly, the cash back you'd be entitled to may be restricted to 20K, even if your R&D claim suggests you're entitled to more than that. Again, we'll wait and see how that sort of plays out, because um, that's very, very new. Hand over to Dan. Thanks, Mo. So, 
to summarise then, some, some final thoughts. Um, R&D relief can have a big benefit to your company, um, either by cash flow advantage or, or by an absolute tax benefit. Um, if you've not claimed before, it's definitely worth considering what, what the activities that your company undertakes uh, to have a think about whether there's any qualifying spend in there, whether there's any scope to make a claim. Likewise, if, if you have claimed before, it's worth reviewing that and, and refreshing any methodologies to if there's any scope to improve or maximise the claim. Um, so we're, we're always happy to have a chat to ex explore that scope if, if you've got any particular questions um, or if you'd like any help with, with making claims in the future. Uh, with that, I'm conscious of time, we, we've almost filled the slot, but we'll move quickly to uh, questions and answers, but we're always happy to take uh, any other questions through LinkedIn or through the details we shared earlier. Super. Thank you so much, Matt and Dan. Um, so at the moment, I'm just curious as well, did you guys book in for an exhibition stand? No. No, okay. Um, so uh, Matt and Dan, if you can just make sure, I don't know if you've got a slide with your contact details on as well or LinkedIn links or anything like that. I, I can send you um, LinkedIn profile. Yeah, super. So yeah, if we can add that on, that'll be great. So I'm just gonna stop recording here.